Okay, gang, let's let's get started. There are a few more a few more people will be on the way in. We're we're interrelating in the course, as you know, the issue of global climate change that we spent the first part of the course on from the beginning of April to the end of April. Uh, we've now spent uh, most of uh, this period between April 29th and last week uh, doing the issue of the impeachment, uh, the various uh, issues related to it. And today we're going to be transitioning into part three, which is the relationship of the uprisings uh, at, uh, in North Dakota uh, against the Dakota Access Pipeline and the upcoming uh, uprising against the Keystone XL pipeline that's going to be coming down through South Dakota uh, next to the Cheyenne River uh, Sioux Reservation. Uh, and we're going to be uh, talking about this issue of the role of the indigenous people, not only here in North America, but also in Central America and in the Middle East uh, against the rise of the uh, increase in the output of petroleum in the world directly in the face of the demand on the part of 193 different countries uh, joining together uh, in the Paris Accords in December of 2017 demanding a reduction in the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, this, uh, this extraordinary upsurge in the uh, the development and burning of fossil fuels on the part of the Trump administration uh, is one of the issues that we will be coordinating with the issue of his potential impeachment. All of this uh, issue of the indigenous people uh, and their role in opposing this uh, massive increase in fossil fuel production in the face of the uh, global climate change uh, comes in the context of the, uh, the decision on the part of Donald Trump uh, immediately after his inauguration to uh, issue an executive order. It was the second thing he did in office, in fact. We know that the first thing that he did in office and in coming into office on the 21st of January uh, of uh, 2019 was to issue this prohibition against all Islamic people uh, coming into the United States. Uh, and the second thing he did on January 24th was issue this uh, unilateral executive order uh, ordering the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to reverse their previous administrative decision uh, requiring that the, uh, the, uh, energy, the Energy Transfer Partners Corporation had to stop the construction of nucle the, uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline because they were failing to comply with the requirements of the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, that uh, Trump issued this, this executive order on the 24th of January. Uh, and I wanted to point out that uh, between his coming to office on January 21st, all the way up until April 5th, that first January, February, March, into the beginning of April, uh, Steve Bannon, Stephen Bannon, uh, sat on the National Security Council. Uh, and Steve Bannon was uh, considered to be Donald Trump's uh, primary political strategist. Uh, and it was quite unique to have that type of a person put on the National Security Council, which is usually confined to personnel directly involved in the national security of the United States, uh, ranging from the Attorney General to the the uh, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the, the head of the CIA and others. But Bannon, uh, we, we got a report. Uh, it's a single source uh, at this time, but that Bannon in the uh, National Security Council meeting specifically uh, stated that we, talking about the Trump administration, must treat the North Dakota Lakota, who are rising up against the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, in the potential Keystone Pipeline, we must treat them as anti-capitalist, anti-Christian, religiously driven, indigenous jihadist terrorists, uh, and that they ought to be dealt with accordingly. 
Uh, and as it turns out, that is exactly how they were being treated. Uh, the, uh, the oil corporations that were partners in the, uh, the uh, Energy Transfer Partners Corporation that was building the pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, they called in, as we've mentioned earlier in passing, uh, they called in the Tiger Swan Private Military Corporation to actually uh, deploy against the Lakota people and their allies who had set up camp uh, adjacent to the pipeline route uh, and were publicly protesting the building of this pipeline directly under their sole source of fresh drinking water. Uh, and the, the Tiger Swan Private Military Corporation, as you may recall us mentioning, again, just in passing, but now it's going to be getting more direct attention here in the class, uh, that was uh, it was founded by and the CEO of which was uh, uh, Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel James Reese. Uh, and Lieutenant Colonel James Reese, immediately prior to founding the Tiger Swan Private Military Corporation, had been the director of worldwide uh, anti-terrorist operations for Blackwater International. Uh, and uh, Blackwater International had been created uh, pursuant to a memorandum, uh, a major study actually, that was prepared by the Halliburton Corporation under the direction of uh, Dick Cheney when he was the CEO for Halliburton in between his having served as the Secretary of Defense for George Bush Sr. and then coming on to serve as the Vice President and the Chair of the 5412 committee, uh, heading up covert operations uh, for the W. Bush administration. Uh, that this creation of this private military uh, operation, first Blackwater, and then Blackwater spinning off Tiger Swan Private Military uh, Corporation, headed up by James Reese, was fielded uh, for the first time domestically against American citizens that these private military corporations uh, had, since their uh, resurgence, uh, had been deployed only internationally uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan against the indigenous people in the Middle East, uh, also in Africa, in Nigeria, uh, against the indigenous people, the tribal people that were trying to oppose the drilling of oil and the contamination of their water there, also in Ecuador, uh, on behalf of the private uh, oil corporations against the indigenous people, the tribal people in Ecuador, uh, who were trying to stop the major oil corporations from massively contaminating their water there. Uh, that, but this was the first time that these types of uh, private military forces had been deployed in the United States against citizens. And there was only one other prior time, and that was Blackwater people, had been deployed into New Orleans uh, in the wake of the, uh, of the massive hurricane there and the flooding there. But this was the first time that they'd been deployed in what amounted to a law enforcement capacity here in the United States, uh, in that we uncovered during the discovery process, uh, representing Chase Iron Eyes, uh, who was designated by the intelligence operations uh, of the Tiger Swan Private Military Corporation. He was designated as the leader uh, of this group of uh, religiously driven indigenous jihadist terrorists uh, among the Lakota people. They actually had a, a chart uh, built, uh, a pyramid of all the different leaders that were involved in in generating this insurrection against the pipeline and in the, against the oil corporations. Uh, and in those memos, they called sit reps. They were situation reports that were prepared by the Tiger Swan Private Military Corporation. We found them specifically uh, not only referring to the indigenous people as these uh, religiously driven indigenous jihadist terrorists, uh, but we also saw uh, memos that were prepared by the private uh, public relations company that was brought in, uh, virtually certainly by Tiger Swan, 
uh, because the people that were brought in to run the public relations operations against the Lakota people that were the water protectors was the same public relations uh, personnel that were brought into Afghanistan uh, when, uh, when Lieutenant Colonel James Reese served as the liaison between the United States Pentagon's uh, Joint Special Operations Command and the American Central Intelligence Agency in Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. Uh, and that this public relations outfit was headed up by a fellow by the name of Mark Feifel. Mark Feifel uh, headed up a, a private public relations firm that was called the Behind the Scenes Public Relations. Uh, and he actually put out uh, memos uh, with bullet points on them, uh, instructing the local police and sheriff's departments about how to refer to the people. And it was in those kind of memos that we found these references to referring to the indigenous people, the Lakota people, as indigenous terrorists and uh, jihadist terrorists. Uh, and so that the, this uh, overarching view of the indigenous people had been developed by these private military corporations in the Middle East, uh, where they had developed a whole covert operations uh, to go in to try to disempower these indigenous organizations in the Middle East to, who were opposing the uh, occupation of the Middle Eastern oil fields uh, by the United States uh, military. And the, the reason that I point out this particular uh, quote from Bannon uh, in his capacity as a member of the National Security Council of the Trump administration was because, as I said, we traced that exact same language into the situation reports uh, that, were, that we obtained uh, from the, uh, the Tiger Swan Private Military Corporation. And this harkened back to an earlier uh, set of information that we had had. Uh, I had gotten information when I was in uh, Rome uh, back in uh, 2000 and, uh, and let's see, 2017, 2015, 2016. So this was 2016. In June of 2016, uh, I had been, I was at the Vatican having meetings there, uh, and a man by the name of Johann Ix, who was the head of the Vatican uh, library in the archives, uh, ha invited me into his office, and he showed me a videotape of Steve Bannon uh, actually having this, he piped into a meeting that was being held in the Vatican by a group called the uh, Institute for Human Dignity. Uh, it was really this hardcore right-wing uh, kind of fascist group of people uh, from around Italy, mostly, uh, that they were, they were people that participated in a group called Opus Dei, uh, this right-wing uh, Catholic kind of semi-fascist group, and the Knights of Malta, which is kind of a full-fledged fascist group, uh, that uh, they, were, uh, they were people that were involved in these meetings of this Institute for Human Dignity. And Steve Bannon uh, piped in through Skype to do a presentation to them. Uh, and this was on uh, uh, June 27th of 2014. Uh, and he gave a big, big long speech and answered a number of questions that these people had. And it was in, at this time that he sort of laid out to them this kind of overarching strategic vision that he had and that he was communicating to Donald Trump uh, in which he was asserting that it was the indigenous people, the people that were non-Christian people, non-white, non-Christian indigenous people around the world that constituted an extreme threat to the vision that uh, he had of trying to reestablish a white Christian culture uh, in the West uh, in order to defend ourselves ultimately against China. Uh, uh, that, that somehow the United States and the European countries were degenerating. <clears throat> they had 
uh, they started losing access to their uh, Christian, Judeo-Christian roots. And that this had to be reestablished if we were going to gird our loins uh, against the rise of this new Asian empire in China uh, and East Asia. And that, that we had to deal with these indigenous people uh, in Western civilization who were basically attempting to infiltrate and, and uh, organize against capitalism. Because he was pointing out that capitalism uh, is, in fact, the kind of natural moral order, uh, as he saw it, uh, that flowed out of basic Judeo-Christian ethical values. And that the war against the capitalists uh, was, in fact, a war against Judeo-Christian ethics in Western civilization. Uh, and that these non-Christian indigenous people were rising up <clears throat> all around the world to threaten uh, the capitalist order. Uh, and there's a, there's a long speech that he gave, uh, which included the answers to his questions, uh, which you can find uh, on the internet. Uh, if you just want to look it up, it's, uh, you just look up a Steve Bannon uh, Skype call into the Vatican uh, in uh, 2014. And uh, I, I was tempted to read bunches of quotes out of this thing for you, as you can see, except that it gets too extensive. Uh, but you can, you can look up some of those yourself. And the reason that that's important is because it echoes the writings of a guy that I mentioned to you earlier, and this is fellow Samuel, Samuel P. Huntington. Samuel P. Huntington uh, wrote this book that had its precursor as a, a major article in Foreign Affairs Magazine. Foreign Affairs Magazine uh, is the magazine published by the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and <clears throat> this is a, a book that he published right at the end of the Cold War. And he published this, uh, pointing out, saying that the, the uh, leaders, the economic and <clears throat> political and social leaders of Western civilization had to get a grip on the fact that they were in danger of being basically uh, transcended by a new Asian empire that was rising to power under the leadership of China. And that the major post-Cold War dynamic uh, on the planet, now that the Cold War was over between the Soviet Union and the United States, that the, the new challenge was going to be the rising of this new uh, Asian empire headed up by China. And that therefore, conscious steps had to be taken on the part of the leadership of Western civilization to avoid uh, all, of this, uh, all of this attempt on the part of non-Christian, uh, non-Caucasian cultures to try to basically infiltrate Western civilization. Uh, and there, there are a whole series of, you, you see the little pink gizmos here <laughs> in the book. There's all kinds of these quotations that are set forth in the book that are kind of things you thought they'd never say uh, in print. But uh, he he's set it forth uh, at the end of the Cold War saying, look, it's time to stop shilly-shallying around. And let's be clear about what the danger is here. Uh, in all of, all of this, uh, this effort uh, on the part of uh, the, the uh, different indigenous people around the world uh, to infiltrate Western culture and to establish what he calls multiculturalism, this, this drive toward multiculturalism uh, in Western civilization, undermining the white Christian uh, uh, Judeo-Christian ethics uh, was a weakness in Western civilization. And that if we were going to be able to adequately and successfully confront the rise of a new Asian empire, we had to uh, get rid of all of this multiculturalism. And we had to sort of get back to the fundamentals and understand that the basic organizing principle of Western civilization is ultimately Judeo-Christian ethical values. Uh, ultimately, he said Christianity, uh, and to be really clear about it, he said Roman Catholicism. Uh, 
and that he was pointing out that, that there should be a kind of a reunion, a reuniting of R R Roman Catholicism with Russian Orthodoxy, uh, Christ the, the Orthodox Christian Church of the Russian Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox was a major element that was important for us to focus on uh, if we were going to unite against uh, China in the new rising uh, Asian empire. So you, you get this information coming out right at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and that this, I'm suggesting to you, is the overarching uh, arc of what it is that's going on right now. All the things that we see happening that result in this confrontation with Trump and his strange relationship with Putin and uh, the efforts on his part to participate with uh, the people that are involved in the purchase of the Russian oil company uh, and the development of the 87 billion barrels of oil under the Arctic shelf, that type of things that are going on now, all of this was uh, pre-shadowed pre uh, by uh, these kind of conversations that were going on right at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and so what I, what I want to do is, in, in this latter, the last third of the, of the course, I want us to focus on uh, the, this potential that the indigenous people have of the world to rise up uh, against this type of a mobilization that is going on that is centered around the seizure and occupation of the Middle Eastern oil fields uh, and the attempt to form an alliance, a secret deep alliance between the oil corporations of Western civilization that have had virtual monopoly control over all of the oil in the Middle Eastern oil fields since the end of the First World War, uh, pursuant to the signing of these exclusive lease agreements uh, with the seven major oil corporations in Western civilization under Aramco, the uh, American uh, Arab Oil Corporation. Uh, this, this overarching dynamic that's going on now really explains a good deal of what you see happening that seems puzzling to everyone. And so uh, what I want to do in, the, in the, this last third of the course, I want to kind of review the history of this uh, aggression on the part of Western uh, powers to seize and control the Middle Eastern oil fields, to uh, now try to establish this kind of sub Rosa uh, alliance with uh, Putin and the Russian oligarchs to potentially gain access to the, uh, the oil fields in Russia, uh, both under the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, and also, very importantly, up under the northern uh, Arctic shelf. Uh, which is within the, the economic zone that's been declared by Russia and under the control of Rosneft, which is the private Russian oil company. Okay? Uh, and so that the, uh, this is all in the context of the, uh, the thing that we ended up at the end of part two of the course talking about this peculiar dynamic that was going on uh, between Trump and, and Putin. This peculiar uh, involvement of, of these 24 people that were all invited to a closed door VIP cocktail on April 27th of 2016 uh, to be there for the first foreign, major foreign policy speech given by uh, Donald Trump. Uh, which had been moved from the National Press Gallery suddenly to the Mayflower Hotel, uh, sponsored by the Center for the National Interest. Uh, that, 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 that goes a long way in explaining uh, what the dynamic is that's going on there. And you remember that one of the people that was there, in addition to the people who were participants actively in purchasing the 20% of the Russian oil company, uh, that one of the other people that was there was Robert McFarlane, uh, one, of the, one of the characters in the Iran-Contra uh, uh, scandal. And uh, Robert McFarlane is the one who shortly after that April 27th uh, VIP cocktail party, where the 24 people were, 
including him. He wrote the article in the, uh, in the National Interest, the magazine of the Center for the National Interest, in which he said Russia will become an integral partner with the United States in ensuring the energy security of West, the Western world, which is a little peculiar because what this means now is uh, they're perceiving this group of people that were around Trump uh, in that gathering, uh, they, they perceive Russia no longer as being part of the East. You know, the, the whole long East-West conflict <laughs> that people were, were uh, using to characterize the confrontation between Ru Russia or the Soviet Union and the United States no longer seems to obtain. That uh, the, he's being cons the Russia is being considered part of the West in a certain sense. And so the, the question is, if Russia is now part of the West, in, in being a partner in ensuring the, the security of the, of the petroleum and energy for the Western world, who's the Eastern world? Well, the Eastern world becomes the, the potential rise of the new Asian empire uh, under, under China. Uh, and so, that, so suddenly this begins to echo uh, something that we talked about before, again, only in passing, but we're going to focus on in this one-third of the course, and that is <clears throat> this, this peculiar uh, dynamic that went on uh, in, the, in the week immediately following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union dissolved on December 31st of 1991, I've pointed out to you before, and, I, and the reason that I reiter, reiterate this again and again is sort of like Rachel Maddow. I just keep saying it over and over and over again, and so that you'll remember it, is that in that, follow, that Monday morning following the dissolution of the Soviet Union on December 31st of 1991, uh, in the first week of January, uh, there was this, uh, this convocation of people in the uh, West Wing of the White House uh, under uh, President George H.W. Bush in his Defense Department, under his Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, that, uh, that uh, Paul Wolfowitz, Scooter Libby, uh, Doug Fife, uh, Elliot Abrams, uh, David Addington, a whole group of these people got together and they began to draft the 1992 United States Defense Department policy planning guidance document. Uh, and in this document, as I pointed out earlier, they asserted that here, now that the Cold War is over, we, the United States, are the sole remaining superpower on the entire planet. And so there's going to be a big push uh, on the part of people to cut our military budget. Because after all, for the last 75 years, uh, since the, the uh, overthrow of the Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II, in October of 1917, at the end of World War I, the, the, uh, ever, ever since that time, there's been this Cold War that we here in the United States, in the executive branch, has used as the rationale for a massive military budget every year. That we've insisted that the Soviet Union is dedicated to trying to take over the entire world. And so it's our job to stop them from doing that. So that we have to have ranging from $100 billion to $200 billion to $400 billion to $500 billion, ultimately up to $700 plus billion a year. We have to lay claim to the tax money uh, that comes in through the IRS to fund the most massive military uh, in the history of human civilization. Uh, and so that now that the Cold War is over and the rationale that we have put forth for the last 75 years justifying this kind of massive expenditure, uh, we're going to start getting kind of a lot of pressure to cut the budget. But what we need to do instead is to increase the budget. They said, what we need to do is we need to establish the most powerful military in the history of the world so that we can establish full spectrum dominance over every other nation in the world in every other uh, group, uh, a group of actors uh, of any kind, uh, wherever they are, uh, and against every country, even including inside their own territory. 
We have to have that type of military capacity. And they prepared that, that first draft of that document, and they circulated it in April of 1992 to a very select number of members of the cabinet of George H.W. Bush and a very select number of generals over at the Pentagon. But uh, as I pointed out, one of, one of them leaked a copy of this uh, first draft of the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance Document to the Washington Post. The Washington Post wrote this scathing editorial attacking it uh, as a basic a reemergence of American imperialism uh, and, and gunboat diplomacy. Uh, the New York Times followed that the following Sunday morning in the Sunday New York Times with a second editorial against that, again condemning it as a, a new age of American imperialism. And George Bush Sr. issued a, a public statement uh, stating that uh, he wasn't going to acknowledge whether there was or there wasn't such a top secret document uh, in the Defense Department. But even if there were, it was only a first draft. And therefore, there would be a, a, an additional draft of this. And in fact, he personally engaged in preparing a second draft of this, along with Theodore G. Shackley, uh, his former ADDO, the Associate Deputy Director for Operations of the CIA, when George Bush Sr. was the director of the CIA, back from 1975 to 77, uh, and also with Colin Powell. And the three of them drafted this second draft, and it was virtually identical, the same themes and everything, except that instead of proposing the unilateral establishment of full-spectrum dominance uh, over the rest of the world, they proposed that this be done in alliance with other Western countries. And in that second draft, it specifically proposed that this new alliance be the United States, Canada, Mexico, with a little parens saying that it really means the pre in Mexico, not the indigenous people of, of Mexico, but the pre, which is pri primarily the Castilian Spanish, Caucasians, uh, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Spain, the new reunified Germany, and Russia. If Russia would choose to join in this, now that they had spun off all of their ethnic provinces. Uh, and that the purpose of this new Northern Industrial Alliance, as they referred to it, would be to maintain our continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials needed by members of the new Northern Industrial Alliance. So that, and so that suddenly you have now Russia being included in the plan of the Bush senior administration to be part of this new Northern Industrial Alliance, being suddenly considered by Bud McFarlane and others uh, that were in the Reagan-Bush administration to be part of Western culture, as distinct from the East, which is China. Uh, and so the, the, what, what you see happening here is that, as, as we've said, that this is, this is an attempt in the third part of our course here to explain Trump's reductionist, that is kind of simple-minded, uh, effort to partner with Putin and the oligarchs in Russia uh, business-wise, because that's how it occurs to Trump that let's establish a business relationship between myself and Putin uh, to secure and develop the world's petroleum resources, which in fact are for the, to protect the energy access to, of Western civilization, implicitly to maintain our continued privileged access to this strategic raw material needed by members of the new Northern Industrial Alliance for the purpose of enabling us to establish full spectrum dominance <laughs> over the rest of the world, over all the nations and group actors on the planet. Uh, and this would be, of course, 
the non-Caucasian, in case you hadn't noticed the common theme behind the members of the Northern Industrial Alliance. Uh, those are all ca predominantly Caucasian nations that are be beginning to see themselves as under threat from this, this uh, influx of non-Caucasian people coming in, coming into North America from South America and coming into Europe from the, the various uh, North African countries and Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and that this is the dynamic that we see happening here uh, in the larger context of this new Northern Industrial Alliance attempting to maintain virtual monopoly control over the sources of plutonium, which is, uh, excuse me, of petroleum, uh, to maintain control over the petroleum of the world, not only all of the petroleum in North America, uh, including the tar fields, uh, the tar sands fields in Canada, with the, with the case Keystone XL pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, under the Bakken oil fields of the Canadian southern border in northern United States, to basically pipe them all the way down through the central part of the United States, through Lakota territory, down to the Gulf Coast, where it can be refined and shipped out for sale to countries other than China. And, they, and also, remember, right at the end of that, of that Cold War, what they were looking at was also reaching out to try to establish some type of a partnership with the new Russia to develop the oil, and the natural gas under the Caspian Sea, the oil and petroleum under the Black Sea, and this extraordinary 87 billion barrels of oil under the Arctic shelf of Russia trying to establish monopoly control over the petroleum, which, of course, is what is engineering the rockets and the, the bombers and the, the jet fighters and the tanks and the armored personnel carriers and the, virtually all the aircraft carriers, uh, I except for a couple of the new nuclear-powered uh, aircraft carriers. This is the petroleum is the source of power for Western civilization, establishing its hegemony over the world and over its resources. Therefore, the, the history, the Pulitzer Prize winning account of the history of oil, the epic quest for oil, money, and power uh, by David Jurgen. Uh, this is that casual reading I suggested you might just sort of put under your pillow. Uh, and be able to read portions of it as you were uh, falling asleep at night. So you'll, you'll know basically what the dynamic is that's going on here. So that's what we're up to uh, here uh, in this uh, final month uh, or so, month and a half uh, of the remaining part of the course, is what, trying to determine what the role is of the indigenous people uh, in trying to stop and roll back uh, this specific offensive on the part of the, the uh, white Caucasian you know, business class, uh, the elite in Western civilization, who are attempting to monopolize uh, all of the petroleum of the world and to hold it out of the hands of China. Uh, so where do we start uh, in attempting to evaluate the potential efficacy of the indigenous people to successfully organize uh, along with allies, as we saw at Standing Rock, you know, that there were, they were members of 300 different tribes in North America that came together uh, at Standing Rock, but there were literally tens of thousands uh, of non-Native American people that came to their support, that not only on site, physically at the site, uh, there in North Dakota, up at, the, up at the edge of the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, but tens of thousands of people around the world who, in fact, provided support. You know, sent money, and they sent food, and, and warm clothing and things for the people that were there. Uh, now, the, fir the first option that we have of where do we start in a conversation like this, you know, the, the first uh, potential 
uh, of that, the first option that we have, we could start right back at the founding of the United States government after the Revolutionary War, the creation of the United States Constitution, where you had the uh, Hamiltonians who, remember Alexander Hamilton being the lawyer for the bankers and the financiers and the mercantile class, uh, basically, uh, proposing that an elitist uh, government be created uh, similar to that of England. But rather than having an inherited aristocracy, they would agree to have an elected set of representatives, but they, they actually proposed that the, that the president uh, of the United States be chosen for life, just like a king. They, they insisted that the senators uh, be chosen, not by elected vote of the regular people, uh, but by the state legislature, legislatures in the colonies, and that the state legislatures were voted for only by white male property owners. Uh, and they proposed in their form of the Constitution that only white male uh, property owners who, were ele who elected the, the legislators be allowed to pick the senators. Uh, uh, and that they excluded specifically from the voting power not only non-property owners and not only women and uh, not only non-white people, but explicitly excluded black people uh, not even entitling them to be valued as a full person in taking the census. Uh, and they also excluded Indians, specifically excluded Indians from being considered uh, as part of this whole process. Uh, and they were, they were advocating a very clear type of government run by the businesses, for the businesses. It was the motivation for the new federal government was primarily from the mercantile class that wanted to have a set of common weights and measures uh, for the different colonies. And they wanted to be able to facilitate commerce among, among the colonies. Uh, and they were in tension with the Madisonians. Now, they're often referred to as the Jeffersonians and Jeffersonian democracy, but the reality is, is that the leader of that entire operation was James Madison. Uh, and James Madison is the one who had drafted the Virginia Constitution. It was James Madison who had, in fact, uh, studied under John Witherspoon at uh, the University of uh, New Jersey, uh, along with Aaron Burr, and along with 39 uh, members of the Senate, and uh, um, like 25 different members of the Congress, the original Congress, uh, and three United States Supreme Court justices, uh, and you know, 14 different uh, federal judges, that this, it was Madison that understood the concept of natural law and infused uh, portions of the Constitution with this fundamental set of principles. Most especially, of course, the Bill of Rights, in which they asserted that if you're going to have this kind of elite controlled uh, government, that the Hamiltonians were proposing, there had to be a specific provision for protecting individual liberties uh, set forth in the Bill of Rights. Uh, in that, uh, but even, even those people, even though they were stating things, uh, such as that all men are created equal, and they're endowed by their creator with these inalienable rights, that there was a, there was a foreshadowing uh, of a dynamic that could take place over time to include more people into the electorate uh, and into the citizenship of, the, of this new government. Uh, but but I'm, I'm going to be arguing that we probably shouldn't start all the way back there. We should take a look uh, past the end of the of Revolutionary War to the end of the American Civil War. In the American end of the Civil War in, in 1868, that whole period from the founding of the Constitution in 1789 and the Bill of Rights in 1791 all the way up to 1868, uh, which is not that long a period of time. I mean, you're talking about an 80-year period. You're talking about the, the time of like one lifetime. Uh, but the, at the end of the American Civil War, that ended the period during, of the big struggle 
that was going on between the Hamiltonians uh, on the one hand and the Madisonians on the other hand. And the Hamiltonians basically won uh, in the American Civil War. Uh, that that Civil War was about a lot of things other than freeing the black people from slavery. Uh, in fact, the whole Emancipation Proclamation wasn't even issued by Lincoln until well into the Civil War. The, the, per, the causes of it uh, were myriad. But the fundamental conflict was between the urban industrialists the, uh, and, and the more agrarian people. And I'm arguing that there is a, a second option for where we should begin this conversation about what happened to the indigenous people and the role that the indigenous people might play in countering this offensive on the part of this elite uh, aristocratic, uh, uh, the financiers and their lawyers and stuff. And, and that is, is at the end of the, the Civil War, there was this extraordinarily important period of just like 30 years. I mean, 30 years. And if you go from here back to uh, like 1990, you know, 30 years from now, backwards, you know, you're, you're, basically, you're basically looking at uh, George Bush Sr. as the president of the United States. Uh, so just between that time when George Bush Sr. was the president of the United States up till now, that short 30 year period, there was a similar 30-year period after the end of the American Civil War from 1868 to 1898 when this extraordinary transformation took place in the United States. And these robber barons uh, basically rose to power. Uh, and they created, uh, largely through their appointment of people to the, the federal courts, they established this new vehicle for commerce. And it was the shareholder-owned uh, private corporation uh, in which the corporation would be deemed to be a person. And that that person owned all of the, the assets of the company. And there were shareholders that owned shares of that corporation, but they were completely immunized against any personal liability for anything the company did. And that was, a, that was an extraordinary break with all of history. Any person, or even combination of persons who wanted to join together to engage in some particular form of business undertaking, were at least responsible legally for whatever it is they did. You know, if they injured somebody, if they made a product that injured somebody, or they did something to ruin the entire community with their business, they were considered to be legally liable for that. But this new business vehicle that was created by these people at the end of the Civil War, and actually 1872, uh, a series of, of decisions that were made by the various courts uh, that were peopled by lawyers who had been appointed to the federal judicial positions uh, basically by these rich and powerful people. Uh, and that during that 30-year period between 1868 and 1898, there rose to power some 30 to 40 individuals who, who were engaged in monopolizing through the creation of this new business vehicle. You know, all of the railroads, all of the steel and iron production, all of the mining, you know, all of the uh, agricultural business, you know, they... they they, they took over all of the textile mills. They bought out anybody. They crushed anybody who tried to compete with them. And they engaged in this process. And very importantly, they also took control of, direct control of the United States Congress. They, they took control by just paying money to the people that were candidates for the House of Representatives in the Senate and the presidents. And they took over control of the entire government. Yes. Um, is this what they call limited liability corporations? This which? Like LLCs? The LLC is a new thing. Okay. This was just the regular private shareholder owned business corporation. It was what they call a, a, a Corp C right now. It's a, it's a regular corporation. This is the fundamental premise of those corporations. Prior to that time, a corporation was something that was set up extremely rarely by the government for a government purpose. Like they would set up a corporation to build a turnpike, or they would set up a corporation to build a canal. 
uh, and they would, would uh, entice private investors to come in as a partnership to build this turnpike or a, a canal or something. Uh, and they would be allowed for a certain term of years to recoup their investment with a profit for it. And so they set up a special, uh, a special corporation to do this. They actually did that for some of the colonies. They actually, over in England, they set up a corporation for them to the, 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 the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Corporation, for example, was a thing like that. But they, were, they existed for a very specific limited period of time, for a very specific public purpose, uh, and then they were, they were dissolved. But this new business vehicle that they created uh, shortly after the American Civil War, uh, in, a, in a short 30-year period, was used by these 30 to 50 people to establish complete control over virtually all elements of the economy. Of the, of the American government. Uh, and they, con they seized control of the government itself. And it came to full fruition in 1898, the election of 1896, uh, of uh, McKinley. Uh, William McKinley was elected president. His basic political advisor was Mark Hanna. Uh, a man I, I think I mentioned him in the past. Mark Hanna was the man, he was like the Karl Rove to George W. Bush. You know, the brain of Bush, he was the brain of McKinley. And Mark Hanna is the guy that when he was asked what was the highest possible ambition any human being could have, he said, to earn as much money as you possibly can before you die. Uh, I mean, that was his vision, uh, of, of, and, and it was representative of that whole robber baron era. And very importantly, for the purposes of this last third of our course, this was the period of manifest destiny. This was the, the, this entire robber baron class of people uh, undertook a whole doctrine of manifest destiny in which they asserted that they were entitled to basically take over all of the resources of entire North America and that they were able to wipe out and take away all of the land from the native indigenous people. Uh, they, they went to war against them all. They, they rounded them up and they slaughtered them and they put them in prison camps and they, uh, they took their children and put them into these boarding schools uh, and ordered them to stop speaking their language. Uh, if they were caught off one of these reservations, these prison encampments, they could be killed by any white person uh, lawfully uh, and, and took all of their property away from them. Uh, and this, this was the era not only of manifest destiny, it was the era of the white man's burden. Uh, this was an entire doctrine that they had that white people being inherently racially superior to all of the other races were entitled to govern. That they, that they, uh, they had this burden, this kind of noblesse oblige, they had this obligation to take charge of all the resources, to develop them all, because all of these brown people and red people and black people are sitting on these resources and they don't even know enough to use them. You know, they don't even know enough to kind of totally despoil the land, the land and transform the beauty of our planet into power. And so therefore, they're not entitled. Uh, and so this is what happened. This, this era is an extraordinarily important starting point for us to look to, to understand how this group of white male property owners and their lawyers that were representing the mercantile class and the financial interests and the banking interests, et cetera, basically established full dominion, not only over North America, but they began this quest, this imperial quest of the age of American imperialism. And, and the fact of the matter is, I mean, they, they, they even teach this in high schools, you know? I mean, they, they say, oh yeah, yeah, that was kind of a tough period. You know, that was when we were misbehaving a bit. Uh, you know, like as if that was, well, okay, you know, you killed tens of thousands, you know, wiped out hundreds of thousands of Native American people, you enslaved, you know, tens of thousands of people and bred them like cattle, you know, and well, yeah, that was a bad period. It probably wasn't the best thing we could have been doing. It's that kind of thing, that how they teach it uh, in, in the American schools. But, but this particular period in history sows the seeds of, of what we're facing now. We're, we're reaping the whirlwind of this particular sowing that went on during that entire period of time. 
in the United States during this particular age of imperialism decided that they were going to expand southward uh, into South America. They were basically going to establish complete uh, dominance and hegemony over all the resources in South America. And then they decided they were going to go west. They were going to go out into the Pacific Ocean uh, and they were going to take charge of Hawaii, the Philippine Islands, Guam, and they were working their way over toward China is what they were doing. They saw the entire resources of China, the entire mainland of China off at the other side of the Pacific Ocean as their unique uh, resources. That, so that we wanted to establish not only unique dominion over all of South America, but we wanted to establish our unique access and control over the resources in China. And that what we did is we were going to leave to Europe uh, the debating between and among you know, the UK, United Kingdom, uh, France, uh, Germany, uh, Austria, let those European countries argue it out themselves as to who was going to be in charge over there. And so when World War I began, uh, arising out of a clash of the interests of all of those major imperial uh, agents over there, those different nation states, we were just going to stay out of it. And we were going to continue to mobilize and, and exercise control over South America and Central America and move west into the Pacific. That is, that is what was happening. Uh, and when, when we got to, we didn't, even, we didn't even come into the World War. World War started in 1914. We didn't even come in until 1917. And we didn't even have any troops on the scene until late into 1917. And what we concentrated on doing is sending an expeditionary force into Russia, primarily, to, to go into Russia to crush the Bolshevik Revolution that had arisen. Because in October of 1917, the, the peasants and people of Russia rose up against uh, Tsar Nicholas II and overthrew him uh, and established the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And, and declared that they were withdrawing from World War I. And so the United States, under the, the leadership of Robert Lansing, who was the Secretary of State, you know, sent a United States-led foreign military expeditionary force into Russia to try to crush the Bolshevik Revolution. So there started that trouble. Okay? And, uh, and the United States then joined in in the, the drafting of the Versailles Treaty at the end of uh, World War I. And I've talked with you about this before, uh, but the, the Robert Lansing as the Secretary of State uh, was the son-in-law of uh, John W. Foster, who had been the Secretary of State uh, under, uh, in, 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 18, in 1893 under uh, uh, Benjamin Harrison. And he is the one who promulgated this kind of imperial venture of going out into the Hawaiian Islands and taking them over and, uh, and pushing into South America. And they started pushing to try to consider building this entire canal down in Panama. And they had this entire idea that this entire realm was uh, under their control. And that, that, was, uh, that was John W. Foster. And he was the father-in-law of Robert Lansing who became the Secretary of State under Wilson, and he was, in fact, the grandfather of John, w., uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, uh, who, in fact, were brought to the Versailles Treaty negotiations by, by uh, Robert Lansing, their uncle, and they personally drafted the reparations portions of the Treaty of Versailles and put into the treaty the demand that Germany be held responsible for the war, World War I, and that they have to pay reparations for that aggressive war. And, uh, and what, I don't want to get too far afield in this, but the, bo the bottom line is that particular group of people that was organized as Brown Brothers Harriman, the private investment firm among all these robber barons that I've talked about, this group from 1868 to 1898, that that group of 30 to 50 men that took over all of these different uh, elements of the American economy, they sat as a combined group of people 
at this place, this Wall Street financial firm of Brown Brothers Harriman, uh, and decided how they were going to divvy up all the resources, not only of the United States with their corporations, but internationally. And that they, they coordinated and co-opted the federal government. They, for example, ordered in uh, United States uh, military expeditionary forces into various places in South America over and over again, <clears throat> including Nicaragua, for example. 1903, they sent in a foreign military expeditionary force uh, under, the, uh, under General Butler, the commandant of the United States Marine Corps, to establish uh, control over Nicaragua. Uh, they, they overthrew the, the governments in Panama in order to build the, Panamanian, the, the Panama Canal. They were engaged in all of these types of, of activities uh, during, during that entire period. And so that this group that sat together in Brown Brothers Harriman, they were all the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman that chaired those meetings where they sat together to coordinate their activities, that that was, the guy's name was George Herbert Walker. And George Herbert Walker is the grandfather of George Herbert Walker Bush, George H.W. Bush, and is the great-grandfather of George W. Bush, George Walker Bush. And that's the, that's the group that, in, sitting in Brown Brothers Harriman, that helped coordinate this entire operation uh, under the, through the leadership of their law firm, Sullivan and Cromwell. And Sullivan and Cromwell was the law firm where both John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles were, were partners in that law firm. So the, this is, uh, this is the, the period that I want to focus on uh, as the period in which this elitist element that had indeed participated in their earlier, uh, the, the earlier uh, iterations of them uh, in setting up the American Constitution, having this kind of elitist dimension to it, but this, this uh, group at Brown Brothers Harriman is so important to understand that this is the group that helped choreograph at the end of World War I not only the imposition of the reparations requirements against Germany, but also undertook to be the, the group that loaned money to Germany to pay those reparations. And they also loaned the money to Germany to rebuild their military. Uh, and they, and they, they made massive loans to Germany uh, to rebuild Germany to become the bulwark against Bolshevism uh, in Europe because they were now locked in this ideological struggle with the Soviet Union that had declared that they were not going to participate in this Western capitalist uh, nation-state grounded uh, in acts of imperialism. They were going to try to, to counter them. And so that began the entire period of the Cold War that went on from basically October of 1917 all the way to December of 1991, that whole basically 75-year period. But it was, it was during that, that important period right at the end of World War I when this group of people were assembled functioning in this way that it was at that same period that the, the allies now including the United States that helped win World War I, that they established this major commission. This becomes extremely important for us here in this final third of our course, that they established a 22-person commission in 1922, following the end in 1918 of World War I. They established a 22-person commission under the chairmanship of Winston Churchill, who was the, uh, the, uh, the Secretary for Colonial Affairs of the United Kingdom. Uh, and what they did is they turned toward the entire Middle East that had been under the uh, hegemony of the Ottoman Empire uh, up until the end of World War I. And what they did is because the Ottoman Empire in the form of Turkey had joined as an ally of Germany uh, in Austria, uh, in World War I, they, the, the victors, the allies, took all of that, all of that territory from the Ottoman Empire uh, and established its hegemony over that territory. And through this commission, this 22-person commission, they superimposed the boundaries of nation states 
over that entire area of the Middle East. Uh, just big square blocks of, uh, of territory. And then they, they uh, chose one of the tribes inside that box, that particular box that they chose. They chose one of the, the tribes and put them in as a king. And they undertook the same process that they had in Europe of the nation states, each having their kings, uh, pursuant to the Treaty of Westphalia, uh, in that they, they set up that same system for the Middle East, and they set up Jordan, they set up Kuwait, they set up you know, Syria, they set up the boundaries of Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and they picked a particular family to become the royal family of that area. And what they did is they went ahead and they signed exclusive lease agreements on behalf of the oil companies from the Western civilization, the seven major oil corporations. They divvied up the contracts for the oil inside each of those nation states that were artificially created by the Churchill Commission. Uh, and they made the contract with that royal family, that single tribe, that was made the royal family by the commission and by the allied powers. They made a contract with them that they were going to give an exclusive lease to the seven Western oil corporations, Standard Oil of New Jersey, Standard Oil of California, Royal Dutch Shell, you know, uh, Esso, I guess it was at that time, it was before being Exxon, you know, uh, and uh, the British Petroleum. There were seven of the corporations that had these exclusive lease agreements that were to last for 60 years. And the, the, in exchange for that, the, the uh, Arab American oil corporations agreed that they would give royalties to the private family, to the actual royal family, the single tribe uh, that was there, not to their country, not to help you know, finance anything in their country, but just to that royal family. And so that those royal families became fabulously wealthy uh, over the next 25 years by even having a small percentage, whether it's like five to 8% uh, of the, the net profits that were made by the Western oil corporations. And this is the regime that was set up by the Western allies, a completely artificial set of nation states in what had been historically for tens of thousands of years, just tribal territory of individual tribes in certain alliances among tribes that were in there, but they superimposed a completely artificial European form of government on them with a royal family and kings, and they extracted, all began to extract the oil from those, from those territories uh, and paying those royal families of, of billions of dollars in royalties for, the, for their small percentage of interest in the oil profits and with the understanding and agreement that those royal families would use major portions of those funds to buy military equipment from the Western, the Western countries in order to sustain them in power against their own people. And so that they set up a whole series of these completely authoritarian, dictatorial governments uh, in the Middle East, all propped up by the Western nations, uh, in getting money that was given to those royal families by, as royalties for the oil that they had an exclusive lease agreement on, and they would use portions of the money to buy weapons and armaments from the Western countries and be trained by them in order to suppress their people. Uh, so that, that was the, the uh, regime that was set up at the end of World War I. Uh, and what's, what's extremely important to point out here is that this same group of people that were at Brown Brothers Harriman, these, say, 30 to 50 men that sat in these meetings, that, that uh, <clears throat> in addition to, to asserting complete control and dominion over the American government and pushing into all of Central and South America and asserting control over their resources and expanding out into the Pacific Ocean, uh, heading toward China to get access to their resources, uh, they, they, uh, they uh, also, they also in, in addition to, to doing that, uh, they, they also set up a, a thing called the Union Bank of New York. 
This is 1924. This commission, the Churchill Commission, was 1922. The end of World War I was 1918. And the, the, this Brown Brothers Harriman group were operating fully under the leadership of George, H. W., George Herbert Walker. Uh, and what they did in 1924 is George, Her, George uh, Herbert Walker retired as the CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman, went off and set up a thing called the Union Bank of New York. And the 50 men that were the people that were members of the, uh, of the uh, Brown Brothers Harriman, they helped capitalize that bank. They put in millions of dollars of their own profits that they had been making through their various common investments that they engaged in together. They put the capital into the Union Bank of New York and George Herbert Walker left and became the president of the Union Bank of New York. And he had his son-in-law, Prescott Bush, become the new CEO of Brown Brothers Harriman. Uh, and he went over, then George Herbert Walker went over and headed up the Union Bank of New York, capitalized by the members of, of Brown Brothers Harriman. They set up a foreign subsidiary up in the Netherlands uh, called the Bank of Commerce and Trade, or the Bank of Shipping and Trade, uh, under this guy by the name of Fritz Steisen. Uh, and this group financed the rise of the fascist party in Germany they financed the, the reconstruction of the entire international headquarters of the Third Reich. Uh, they actually, and actually, the lawyer for Brown Brothers Harriman, Alan Dulles, uh, and, and John Foster Dulles, actually sat in a meeting authorizing the appointment of Adolf Hitler to be the chancellor of Germany in 1934. Uh, this, this is extraordinarily important for us to understand to see what it is that's going on here. That this, this entire operation on the part of this, this, not even 1% of the population of the United States, one one thousandth of 1% of the population of the United States, these robber barons, were in fact establishing virtual complete hegemony over the resources of North America, uh, South America, moving toward China, uh, and they had in fact through the Union Bank of New York, set up the financing in Europe to basically establish dominion over all of Europe through Germany. Uh, so this is, this, is the, this is the state of affairs uh, that basically obtained uh, between the end of the American Civil War uh, and the, the ended up uh, generating World War I. And then at the end of World War I, the, this same alliance of people established this type of dominion uh, over not only North America and South America in the Pacific Islands, but also indirectly through their, their creating and financing of the rise of the German state in, in, England, in uh, Europe, they established hegemony over the, the continent of Europe. So that's, that's the, the operation that was going, and they treated the tribal people, the indigenous tribal people of all of the Middle East as, as mere pawns in what they were doing. They, they considered these people to be not entitled to any type of say-so over what was being done in their, in their lands. And that these, these nation states that they set up, these boxes, these artificial boxes of nation states that they set up, you know, were set up completely ignoring the, the actual dynamics of the people that lived inside those particular artificial boundaries. So they had different tribes that didn't really even get along with each other, you know, all put into one particular purported nation state in that they had boundaries that, that divided tribes and put part of the tribe in one nation state and another part of them in the other nation state. Uh, and it was, it was uh, then in that, in that particular uh, process that, uh, that they established, the, they sowed the seeds of what later was to become the uh, Arab Spring and that later uprising of people against these, these authoritarian dictators and their sons, one after another, who stayed in control uh, through the, the doctrine of primogenitor of the eldest sons would take over each one of the kingships and, uh, and they would rule 
uh, with the support of the Western powers that were actually financing their militaries. So, so this is, this is the, uh, the setting uh, for what, what uh, we want to be talking about here in the, in the final third uh, of the course that we want to take a look at uh, the indigenous peoples of the world uh, that have been subjugated uh, by these people, uh, not only in the Middle East, uh, but in Africa, uh, in Nigeria, and the places where these oil corporations are, are exploiting their, their oil and resources, the, uh, in Central America, in Ecuador, and other places in South America. Uh, and and we, we want to try to determine, uh, starting taking a, a close look at what's going on uh, up in North and South Dakota right now, uh, on the part of the Lakota people, uh, the first wave of effort that was, that was generated in the face of the Dakota Access Pipeline to try to stop that pipeline, what the lessons are that were learned there, what is in the offing with regard to the Keystone XL Pipeline, the role that the Lakota people are going to be playing in that. Uh, also other pipelines like the Trans, the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline that is going to be uh, planned to be built from the Bakken oil fields westward all the way th across the Rocky Mountains and down through uh, the, the state of Washington. Uh, there's a Trans Canada Pipeline that they're planning to build up there. Uh, that there, is a, there is a huge process going on right now uh, with the Trump administration being in there. Uh, now, and, and as I say, that you, we've talked before, it, it is not coincidental at all that the Secretary of State of the Trump administration was Rex Tillerson, the CEO for ExxonMobil. As I said, you know, Trump is a reductionist. He's a simple-minded guy. He said, look, if we're going to you know, have taking over and controlling the petroleum of the planet be our primary foreign policy goal. Why shouldn't we have the CEO of ExxonMobil be our Secretary of State? You know, and uh, why, shouldn't we, why shouldn't we have uh, uh, Scott Pruitt, who's a, a rabid opponent of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, the Attorney General of Oklahoma, why shouldn't we have him be the head of the EPA and get rid of all of these limitations on the ability of the oil corporations to exploit oil in any particular environment they choose to, you know? And why, why shouldn't we have the head of the Secretary of Energy be Rick Perry, who is the Vice President of Sunoco, you know, Sunoco uh, Logistics, and, and the, the former governor of Texas, another huge oil state. You know, why, why shouldn't we just do this you know, and, and, and this, is, this is what we're seeing right now. We're seeing a Donald Trump, who is such a, a reductionist and a simple-minded person of just going forward doing what was basically the plan that the Republican administrations had figured out, you know, in the Bush administration, reaching out to Russia to get them to come on board to become an integral partner with the United States in protecting the, uh, the control of petroleum on the planet to keep it out of the hands of China. You know, that what, what we see happening here basically is, uh, and this is the thesis that I'm proposing, is that he is so simple-minded uh, and so completely devoid of any type of moral uh, restraints is that he just sort of went right straight to it. Uh, and it's embarrassed everybody. It's, it's embarrassed the Republican Party uh, they'll keep him there long enough to get their tax breaks. And again, he just turns around and says, hey, why don't we just cut in half, basically, the taxes on corporations you know, and turn them loose to, to run the world? Why don't we l reduce dramatically the taxes on the richest 1% of the people in the country and let them you know, ply their trade uh, as best they can? Let's eliminate the, the estate tax entirely so that they can pass on their wealth to their, their children and grandchildren. Why don't, I mean, isn't that what we're really all about anyhow? He, I mean, he's saying, and so he just goes ahead and does it. And what's happening now is that, that uh, once, the, once the extremely wealthy get their reduction in their income tax, once they get their, the uh, reduction of the corporation taxes, once they get the elimination of the estate tax, now what they're after, of course, is control of the judiciary. And that's why they're still leaving him in there so that he can continue like a moron just to simply appoint, you know, nominate judges uh, from the Federalist Society 
uh, and have McConnell, you know, call them up immediately uh, to, to get a vote of a simple majority of the Republicans. And, you know, but in the meantime, uh, he's, he's humiliating them. He's humiliating the Republican Party in the face of, in the eyes of everybody else. They're saying, wait a second, uh, these people are just as bad as we suspected. You know, these people are doing exactly what they've been accused of being, uh, doing for all these years by the most radical elements in the culture. And so now the Democratic Party, the more moderate Democratic Party after the, the World War II, or the, the end of the Cold War, the, the new more moderate Democratic Party wants to try to make it seem like it's just him. You know, it's just Trump. This, this isn't a fundamental problem. This isn't a fundamental moral problem at the very heart of the body politic of the American government right now. This is just a, a wild hair. It's just one bad apple, one particular individual. So let's try to just figure out what it is he did all by himself, like obstructing justice. You know, that, that, uh, that he actually attempted to fire the, the special counsel, which, as it turns out, he has every constitutional right to do. <laughs> but they're just, they're, they're caught now so off guard that they're, they're making charges against him which aren't even really going to be sustainable, you know, uh, as, as a matter of illegal activities on his part. Uh, but they won't go to the bottom, the bottom line of this thing and say that the reason that he's colluding with Putin and the reason that he's colluding with the oligarchs is because he thinks this is just business. He thinks that this is just the business, that they ought to be able to set up some kind of a, a common partnership you know, to bring in the Russian oil uh, under the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea and the, uh, the Arctic Shelf. We ought to be able to bring them into partnership with ExxonMobil in the, the other oil corporations. You know, so he's looking to say, you know, what, what is it I'm doing wrong here? You know, wh why, is it, why is it everybody's angry at me? You know, I'm only doing the same thing that everybody's been doing since, uh, since the beginning of this thing. And so he feels like he's being unjustly treated and he's being totally indignant about it. And the Democrats are trying to figure out what to do about it. And meanwhile, now, the indigenous people are starting to mobilize. The indigenous people are mobilizing not only uh, in the Native American territories of the Lakotas against the pipelines, the indigenous people in North America, the black people, the, the, the heirs to the slavery uh, of, of our country are mobilizing now in, in voting and getting registered to vote and coming into the polling places and electing people that are more progressive. They're, they're electing black people and brown people. They're electing more and more women. The people who've been consciously excluded from the origins of the Constitution, from the share of power, are rising up against these people because Trump has done us all the favor of making it completely obvious what they're doing. The stuff that they've been doing so subtly before, now it's right in everybody's face. And so now the indigenous people are rising up, they're organizing, and they're going to take power back. That in the, the regular Democratic Party is caught in between saying, wait a second, wait a second, uh, let's not get too carried away here. You know, let's not, let's not do that. And now Trump has come on and he's saying, oh look, let's attack Iran. Let's attack Iran because they're selling oil to China. Wait a second, these guys don't get it. They, they don't understand what's happening here. They're not supposed to be selling any oil to China. We're trying to freeze out China, you know? So, and he says, let's, not only that, but let's pound China with tariffs, which we end up paying, you know? I mean, this guy is a complete moron, you know? And thank God for him. Thank God for him, because he's now completely exposing what these people have been since the very beginning. So the question that we're going to be facing in the rest of the course for the rest of the, the next month and a half or so is can the indigenous people effectively mobilize? Can the, can the indigenous people effectively organize? Can they, in fact, seize power? Very importantly, can they govern? And what type of alliance can responsibly be established on the part of Caucasian people with people from these various indigenous cultures that this elite group of white male 
capitalists in their finance years have been exploiting for all these 250 years and longer. So that's, that's the alliance that we're talking about now, and it's a different alliance than their new northern industrial alliance. It's a, it's a people's alliance. It's an indigenous alliance. And there's going to be leadership rising up over this, and they're going to try to put up new candidates to replace these uh, mealy-mouthed Democrats uh, who have been in the House of Representatives and in the Senate uh, in refusing to vote to protect the planet. You know, I mean, and it's, it seems to have taken a threat to the life of the planet itself before people will mobilize. But now the time has come. The people are all being threatened all across the board. And so therefore, there's a distinct possibility that a high enough percentage of the white Caucasian people are going to join forces with the indigenous people to try to save the world, to try to save the, the, the climatic system of our planet. From, the, from these robber barons, okay? So that's, uh, that's going to be the, the nature of the rest of the course. So you can start to think about you know, what your fundamental thesis is going to be now that you've gotten the papers done on the, the impeachment. And we're going to come full circle round to try to end up relating all three of these phenomena, the global climate change, the rise of the indigenous people, and the potential impeachment of Donald Trump to get rid of him uh, before he does more damage, but not before he enlightens all the right voters about what these people are up to and who it is that's causing the global climate change for their own private profit. Okay? We'll, uh, we'll see you on Thursday, okay?